so uh, my name is Tom Lancaro. I run Adam's Apples Nursery, Fruit Tree Nursery in East Devon. Um, might know some of you, um, might have sold some of your trees. But um, yeah, so this is going to be um, a kind of whistle stop tour on how to plan a community orchard. Um, I try to keep it as um, sort of kind of uh, as, as straightforward as possible. Um, if if you have questions, as um, as he said, just uh, type them in and we'll answer them at the end. So um, let's start then. So um, so the first thing, uh, considerations for choosing uh, a site. Um, Obviously, when it comes to community orchards, lots of the time um, your, your site is going to be allocated. Um, there's not going to be a lot of choice. But um, uh, but even so, um, creating shelter is uh, a really important um, first step. Um, the trees are uh, trees won't grow. They won't thrive if they are competing or well, not competing if they're being blown around in the wind all the time. Um, the pollinating insects won't get a chance to do their work, and uh, and obviously as the trees get bigger, if they get bigger, then there's a, a bigger chance of them blowing over. So, um, so choosing a site or um, uh, creating a site with shelter uh, is really important. Now, it might mean that you've got um, you might already have hedges around the hedges around the area, in a, and it might mean that you're going to have to manage them slightly differently. It might mean that you're letting them um, grow up um, a bit higher. So for every, you've got to remember for every meter in height, every vertical meter, you're, you're providing about eight meters worth of uh, horizontal shelter. So you only need a hedge that's a few meters high to be providing an awful lot of shelter um, for your young trees. Um, and if you are in an exposed site, um, then uh, planting windbreaks is, is one of the best things that you can be doing. Tom, I'm so sorry to interrupt. That's Could that? you turn your microphone up? Sure, yeah. Um, how did we do that last time? Um, hang on a minute. I'm just going to stop sharing the screen a minute and go to. Sorry, the... everyone. Just had a couple of people say that you're a bit quiet. Yeah. Um, is that any better? Can you hear me a bit better now? Um, I can hear you fine. Um, for those of you who couldn't, is that a bit better? We'll, we'll carry on. We'll carry on. I'll get a little bit closer as well. But we'll carry on. Um, that's basically full, full bore. So yeah, um, no, so that's that's better. Thanks. Thanks okay. so much, Tom. No worries. Sorry about that. Okay, so we'll jump back in here. Um, okay, so we were talking, I was talking about, yeah, creating shelter. So if you, if you haven't, if you've got a bit of an exposed site, um, then as well as thinking about the, uh, the trees that you're going to put in, the fruit trees you're going to put in, um, then uh, thinking about creating the shelter is also really important. Um, ideally, you do this uh, a couple of years in advance, but in reality, it's probably going to have to happen at about the same time that you, as you plant the trees. Really good windbreak trees. We've got some examples here. Uh, willow. Um, the, both the two top pictures are some um, uh, willow windbreaks, and they're planted about kind of between three and five meter um, to, uh, cuttings to the meter. So you plant them really close, and um, and they will grow, you know, a couple of meters a year. Um, uh, so you're getting nice vertical um, shelter or nice vertical um, growth, providing shelter in the orchard really quickly. Poplar, same same story. Hybrid poplar grows really quick, and Italian alder is another really nice one. But also, you know, um, you might just want to go for a, a more kind of traditional hedge, and the, the traditional hazel, uh, hawthorn, um, field bay, or blackthorn, as we've got in the bottom right there. It's it's just as good. It's just going to take a little longer to establish. Considerations for choosing a site. The other thing is about um, drainage. If your potential orchard looks uh, anything like that photo, then you might want to think again. 
Um, fruit trees don't like growing uh, in, with wet feet. So they don't like growing in, in soaking wet ground. Now, obviously everywhere uh, at certain times of the year becomes a bit soggy, a bit damp, and, um, and maybe even might sometimes get flooding. But if you've got an area like this, that's, that's kind of standing water for long periods of time, then really it, it suggests that um, it's not suitable for planting fruit trees. Um, it might be because, um, uh, it might be because uh, of, of poor drainage, perhaps compaction, and it, which is something that, that can be alleviated. Um, if it's had uh, kind of livestock out on it over winter for many years, or if it's perhaps a new a new site, maybe part of a new development, and it's had plant machinery going over it um, kind of all year round, um, it can be kind of alleviated with uh, subsoiling, maybe plowing, um, with the kind of professional contractors. Um, but that it, it, it is something that would need to be um, sorted out in the year before at least. Um, uh, planting your trees on there. Um, people often, uh, when people, when we speak to customers, they often say, oh, we've got clay soil, it's terrible. Really. You know, um, actually, clay soils are hold on to moisture um, uh, uh, and they can, and the, so actually they, they, they can be really good. Um, uh, it's the, when, when the ground is saturated, it's often because of compaction. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's something to consider when you're looking at your potential site. In terms of orchard layout, another thing is about um, cold air and, and where, you, where you choose to put your different tree species. So frost pockets can be, um, can be uh, an issue if you're planting trees that flower early in the season. So frost pockets occur when we have a slope, slight slope and or gradient and the cold air will kind of roll down the slope and settle in the bottom, like in the picture there. And when it comes to um, choosing fruit trees and, the, and where you plant them on your site, variety, uh, species like um, pear and plum, cherry, quince will flower earlier in the season than that. Late April, May. But often pears in a good year, you know, in a kind of warm, dry spring, you can get pears and cherries coming out in March into flower. So you want to avoid those um, those points in the field where, or points in, on the site where you've got potentially uh, cold air sitting in frost pockets, because you're just going to, um, well, it, it means that you're you're having much less likely that you're going to get good um, yields if you're if you're trees in flower and then it's got cold air sitting around it, um, which can damage the flowers basically, they can abort. So um, think carefully about um, where you put these early flowering type tree types on your site. And um, you'd be better off if you've got these cooler areas. It's the same if you've got um, a site next to a river, it's always gonna be colder next to the water. So think about putting the later flowering tree types um, in those kind of cold spots. Another consideration for the layout is um, thinking about the aspect, so where the sun is in relation um, to where you plant your different tree types. So anything that you're kind of picking off the tree and eating, which we call dessert fruit, so eating apples and um, eating cherries, eating plums, eating pears, um, you basically want them to be as sweet as you can. And uh, the sweetness comes from the sunlight. So you wanna be planting these tree types uh, the ones with the sweetest fruit, the ones that you want to be the sweetest, you want to be planting those in the areas that have the most amount of sun. So when, you, when you've, um, when you've uh, been allocated your site or you've determined that you're going to put this um, community orchard uh, in a particular area, think about where the sun comes, think about which parts of the, of the site are getting the most amount of sun and at which point in the day. If you've got an area that actually gets the sun in the morning, but by middle afternoon, it's in the shade, even in the summer, then those are the areas you want to be putting your uh, cooking apples or maybe some of your sharp cider varieties or some cooking, uh, cooking plums, for example. And the areas that are getting the sun all through the afternoon and the evening, that's, uh, that's where you want to be putting these um, varieties that require lots of sunshine for um, to be properly ripened. Um, quite often, it's the same spot where you've got the um, the, the cold, the, the, the frost pockets, or it might be the sunniest spot is the bit at the top of the field, which is also the windiest. So 
there's never a, um, there's rarely an ideal site so it's, there's a there's a bit of compromise going on between uh, having shelter having the most amount of sun and avoiding the kind of cold spots but um, just bear those kind of three things in mind um, and uh, when you're when you're plotting which trees go where on the site The pollination is something which um, people get in a, it confuses people. Um, I'm going to try and explain it as simply as possible. Um, so, uh, so fruit trees will pollinate um, within their own species. So you, you need an apple tree to pollinate an apple tree. You need a plum tree to pollinate another plum tree and a pear tree for a pear tree, etc. cetera. Um, but within that, within that, um, the uh, let's say apples for example you have some varieties which will flower earlier in that season than another variety which flowers much later and so we've divided the season the flowering season into groups because um, generally it's one to five it might be a to d a to e um, uh, and it means the same thing um, they've divided the flowering season into different sections and one or A is the, means that the tree is going to be flowering in the earliest part of that um, flowering season. So for apples, we're talking about like mid, late April, perhaps. And uh, number five, flowering group five or, or E, um, means that the, that vari a variety is going to be flowering at the very end of that flowering season. What that means in practical terms is that um, a flowering, uh, a variety of a particular flowering group, let's say like this example, flowering group two, it will be in flower at the same time as a variety would flower in group one, group two, which is the same as it, or group three. So it's the same or the adjacent flowering group, but it won't be in flower by the time a variety in group four or five comes out. So we've got a variety like Adam's pear main, uh, a, a flowering group two variety. Anything in flowering group one, two, or three will be fine. They will cross pollinate each other. But Dabonet, for example, cider variety, which is very late into flower, by the time the Dabonet comes out, the Adams pear main will have finished. So they won't be able to cross pollinate each other just because they aren't flowering at the same time. Hopefully that makes sense. It's the same thing for um, each species. So the same thing applies for plums within plums and cherries within cherries. The flowering period for um, cherries and plums is, uh, is shorter than apples. So apples have quite a long flowering period, but it's the same principle. Um, now it's more of a problem if you're only planting say two trees in your garden and it's less of a problem if you're planting a whole orchard with lots of different varieties because there are only five groups for example with apples if you have more than uh, half a dozen varieties you've probably covered all of them um, so the key really uh, is to plant a large spread or a kind of decent spread um, of varieties uh, of the same species um, uh, and if you want to really make sure that you are um, covering all the flowering groups or you, you're kind of interested in it and you, and you enjoy it, then plotting them uh, when it comes to uh, locating the, the trees on the site, plotting them um, within the species, um, but with the same or adjacent flowering group kind of next to each other will ensure that the trees, each tree and its neighbor will be in flower at the same time. Crab apples um, will also help because crab apples have a very long period of flowering. So they will start flowering in group uh, with the uh, flowering group one, and they will still be flowering by the time um, flowering group five. Um, often um, they extend that, that, that whole period. So flat crab apples can be really useful for apples. They're not going to offer any um, pollinating assistance to anything other than an apple. But um, uh, there, it's a, it's a good addition if you've got, yeah, and it can increase pollination, um, uh, successful pollination. So um, hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Um, we can come back to that if people have got questions. But a, a spread of varieties and a spread of tree types is the most a kind of fail-safe way um, to ensure good pollination. Maybe we talk about triploids later. I'm going to gloss over it at the moment, but we can come back to triploids. So the next thing to consider uh, are rootstocks. So the rootstocks are the part of the tree that in the nursery, we literally buy the rootstocks um, and then we graft the variety onto the rootstock. Um, so we can graft the same variety or we will graft the same variety onto lots of different rootstocks because the rootstocks, the different rootstocks determine the um, final size of the tree. Um, so uh, a variety like Adam's Permain will, will 
graph them onto some standard rootstocks. So this is the, the largest rootstock, um, sorry, it's the rootstock that will produce the largest tree. And we will also graft it onto some half standard rootstock so that we, which is a tree that will be half the size of the standards. So you've got a choice there. You can buy, um, quite often you can buy a variety on different rootstock um, according to how big you want your, your trees to be um, at, their full, at their full size. So we call the largest, um, any trees on, on the most vigorous rootstock which will produce the largest trees, we refer to them as standards. We've got a list there, apples, we're talking M25, plums, Brompton, cherries, Prince Avium, and, uh, or F12-1, perhaps the name, and pears, um, Kirchen, Celeron, Pyrus, Communis. So these names refer to the rootstocks, and the rootstocks are clonally produced by other nurseries. They're, um, they're uh, um, vegetative cuttings, which we buy and then um, graft onto ourselves. Um, so the standards will make the very largest trees. We're talking about eight meters in height and spread, and pear trees, they can be um, twice that size. Um, so you need quite a lot of space <laughs> to fit these trees in. If you had an acre, if you had a community um, orchard site that was an acre, um, it's about 4,000 square meters, you are looking at about 50 trees, 40 to 50 trees at eight to 10 meter spacings. Um, the advantage of them is that they are really strong growing. They will um, make big trees, strong trees, they will live a really long time. They have the most benefit for wildlife because they have such a long, um, a long life. If you've got old trees in your garden or you see old trees in an old orchard, uh, kind of 120 years old, they will be on these standard rootstocks or seedling rootstocks, or similar thing. Um, so they offer the most amount of habitat um, for wildlife. So if that's a consideration then uh, for your community orchard, then um, think about including some, of the, some trees on standard rootstocks. The disadvantage is that they take up a lot of space. So if you haven't got an acre, if you've got a quarter of an acre, well, you're talking about, um, you know, you're using a lot of space with, with far fewer varieties or tree types. So you might want to consider half standards. Now, half standards mean, um, <coughs> excuse me, half standards mean about half the size of standards. So you're talking about four meters, five meters in height and spread. Um, you can control this a little bit with pruning. You can keep them a bit lower if you have a kind of open centered tree. Um, but essentially the tree will want to get to about four or five meters. It does vary between from variety to variety, but it's about that size. Um, yeah, so you can, if you're planting them at half the spacing, then obviously you can get a lot more in. You're looking at about 150 trees to the acre on a half standard rootstock. Um, you need about four or five meters between them. And like in the photo, you can be picking the fruit from the ground. It doesn't require ladders. So with standard, with uh, varieties on a standard rootstock, really, unless you're picking the fruit up off the floor, most of that fruit is high up in the high up in the tree, and you're going to need a ladder to pick it. Very useful if you're going to be using sheep or um, uh, cows to be grazing the grass, but um, not so useful perhaps in a community orchard if you want people just to go be able to kind of go around and help themselves with fruit. So half standard rootstocks, we've got. Uh, a number of different ones there um, for the different variety, for the different tree types. Um, the trees themselves are less long-lived. They still, you know, you're still getting kind of 50, 60 years, perhaps a bit more out of these half standard trees, but they're not as long-lived as the standards. Um, and uh, and the, the, the actual yields themselves, um, the yields aren't as, as big. But because you've got more trees in a given area, you can have more varieties and um, the, the total yield is bigger. And then you also have very dwarfing rootstocks. Now, um, it, I actually don't recommend very dwarfing rootstocks for a community orchard because uh, really a community orchard, the reality of a community orchard is it often has to kind of fight for itself a bit. And the very dwarfing rootstocks, um, because in order to keep the trees very small, it means that the rootstocks themselves aren't very strong. They're not very vigorous. The trees need a lot of attention to do well. They need um, permanent staking like this one. They need um, permanent weeding, perhaps in very hot weather, they might need irrigating. Um, in a community orchard setting, I would avoid these really. I would go for something with a bit more vigor, a bit stronger growing that can, um, can look after themselves really, a bit, bit tougher. But you can get, if, if you're really determined or you want a mixture and you want some really small things, then you can get, um, you can get varieties on these more dwarfing rootstocks. So um, choosing rootstocks and varieties. As I said, one of the perhaps the first 
the first determining factor is how much space have you got. If you've got lots of space, then you can um, you could consider having a, a, a stats, more standards, perhaps. Um, if you're if you're tight on space, then you might want to think about maybe mostly half standards with one or two, perhaps if you're um, if you'd like a mixture of, of tree heights and things. Um, again, when it comes to the layout of the orchard, where where the sun comes from, um, where the shade is, obviously if you've got a mixture of uh, standards and half standards, you want those taller trees, those eight ten meter trees on the northern side of your plot or the um, uh, kind of northeasterly part of the plot so that they're not causing the shade on the smaller trees which hopefully will be on the kind of south and, and southwesterly part of the orchard. Um, so agreeing the objectives as a group so what do you want from your community orchard? Um, it might be a bit of all of these things but there are a few different kind of distinct things. Um, firstly it could be predominantly about wildlife, uh, um, creating wildlife habitat diverse um, uh, habitat for different species um, and different creatures or uh, and or uh, and a kind of an amenity orchard you know a place for people to go and um, relax and um, uh, you know help themselves to fruit and things and maybe some community events but if this is the case then um, and it quite often is the case um, and you, you know having a long season of use so having a, a large variety lots of varieties of different tree types and lots of varieties within the tree type um, so that you've got a really long season of use is, is, is our recommendation. So, you know, if you have um, cherries that can start, that start getting, um, that will start ripening in July through to kind of plums through August, September, pears, apples, which we'll see right through till March, April, then you can have a really long season um, uh, and uh, you're creating uh, a much longer flowering period for pollinating insects. You've got all that, um, you've got all the kind of dropping fruit on the floor for months of the year. So um, uh, yeah, that, that's that's um, the best kind of route for a, a wildlife or amenity orchard, is having as much diversity as you can, basically. Um, if uh, if it's more of a kind of, um, uh, not commercial, but if there's a bit more of a kind of um, uh, commercial or enterprise element to it, and you there wants to be kind of, you know, you're thinking, well, we want to pick the fruit and make juice. I know that, in like, for example, Bright Brighton Permaculture Trust do this. Um, uh, you know, they want to pick the fruit, make the juice, and then as a community, and then sell the juice, create a bit of um, income to ma for maintenance and things like that. Um, uh, then maybe having at least some of the orchard ready for harvesting at the same time, rather than having a really long period of a uh, period of uh, ripening, actually having fruit. Um, ready at the same in the same week or two um, means that you could uh, press lots of fruit. You could have a have an apple day, say in in the end of October or at the beginning of October, and press. Uh, know that you're going to have lots of fruit that you can press in, um, uh, rather than <laughs> excuse me, rather than um, having your uh, uh, your apple day and, and realizing that there's only one tree that's actually got any apples on it. Um, the other thing is. Um, for uh, for um, community orchards, uh, half standards are really good because, as I kind of mentioned before, you can pick the fruit off the tree. You don't have to be climbing any ladder, any ladders. Um, the other thing is uh, about maybe having a, a a bit of a weight towards dessert fruit rather than cooking fruit. You know, maybe not that many. You know, there's more desire for eating apples, for example, rather than cooking apples. So having a kind of having the ratio. Of perhaps 80 20 something like that for eating apples to cooking apples um, is is a sensible uh, a sensible way to choose your varieties again long season of use or um, keep things interesting keep people getting in there and, and having fresh fruit all through the all through the summer and the winter um, the earlier apple varieties um, I'm talking about apples now because uh, this is only really applicable to apples and pears actually, but apples and pears. The earlier vari ripening varieties, so things that are ready kind of August, September, don't last as long, they won't be stored as long, or they can't be stored as long before they go soft. Whereas the varieties that ripen later in the season, that you pick later and then can be stored will, will be um, good for eating all through the winter. So actually having a, weighting your, your varieties um, more heavily towards kind of late season um, uh, cultivars, is, is probably uh, is a more um, is a better way uh, 
um, for people to ensure that they, you know the fruit's not being wasted. You don't want half the orchard all being ready to uh, you know varieties that are all ready and done and dusted by the end of August because most of it's on the floor. So um, having a few varieties for kind of August and then increasing it as the season goes on, so you've got lots of late keeping varieties, uh, is quite a good idea. Um, also, dual purpose fruit is really good. So dual purpose for apples, for example, things like Charles Ross and Peter Lock and um, uh, Belle de Bosco. These are great apples for eating. They're good. They've got enough acidity in them that they're good for cooking. They're good for cider. They're good for juice. Dual purpose, um, dual purpose fruit is really useful uh, uh, in a community orchard. I think that's, um, we'll come back to it with, uh, in, in shortly, but labeling is also really important because um, uh, it's, you don't want people going in, well, it's a shame that for people to be kind of wandering in there thinking, oh, this is great, we can help ourselves to some fruit, and then picking a variety in August that really isn't ready until, until January. So um, having some structures, the way the orchard's laid out, perhaps having it um, so that, you know, the, the when you come in one side of the orchard, the fruit is sequentially um, ripening. So you, people know that as you, you know, you only have to go to the trees where the fruit is falling, and those are the ones that are ripe, for example. Um, or having really clear labels or a really good map with the kind of harvesting dates on them could be really um, could be useful as well. I kind of jumped there. I started on the community juice and jumped to the, the middle one, but um, hopefully we've covered all of that. Um, yeah, other things to consider is about, you know, at least choosing some traditional and local varieties. Um, it's not the case that all local varieties are necessarily the best ones, unfortunately, but um, it's good to keep, you know, keep the local varieties going. And, um, and certainly the older varieties, the ones that have been grown across the country for a long time are really, um, generally really good. Um, uh, the more modern varieties don't tend to be as disease resistant. Um, oh, well, that's, well, that's not technically true. The, uh, there are more modern varieties that have been deliberately bred for disease resistance, but um, uh, let's say that the older, more traditional varieties have kind of tested the, have stood the test of time, really, um, in the most part. So those old traditional varieties that everyone, um, you know, has grown for a long time are really worth having in there. Um, and then disease resistant varieties, it kind of goes without saying, you want to have the healthiest trees that you can. Um, some varieties are much more disease resistant than others. Uh, and some are very disease prone. So uh, Cox's Orange Pippin, which everyone knows, beautiful apple, and it's at the, it's at the um, you know, uh, it, it, it's, yeah, uh, the, probably the most, well, one of the most famous um, English apples, absolute nightmare to grow. Um, very disease uh, prone, uh, especially in the West Country. But, um, but you know, something like Sunset, which is a, a Cox um, offspring, if you like, um, much easier, very similar in taste, and, um, but, you know, will grow really happily and healthily uh, in, in the wetter parts of the West Country. So choosing disease with some varieties is um, a really good idea. And um, growing uh, perhaps with the more vigorous varieties as well. And I kind of alluded to it before, a community orchard, often there's a lot of um, enthusiasm in the beginning uh, and after maybe after a few years, um, the orchard has to kind of fend for itself a bit. So having really strong growing, healthy trees, easy to grow varieties is, um, you know, is a, is, a, is a good way to ensure the orchard um, carries on doing well into the future. So best planting practice. Um, we're talking about planting bare root trees, bare root fruit trees. Um, so uh, generally they become available for um, planting from December and then you want to get them in the ground before the end of March, mid-March generally. If the weather's really terrible, if we have an atrocious wet spring, then you know up to the end of March is, is, um, is acceptable. Um, uh, ideally, um, you would mark out the, well, I, I'm sure all of you will be marking out the orchard um, and planning it meticulously. But so marking it out in advance and um, getting the grass nice and, nice and tight in the autumn before um, will make planting much easier um, or grazing it if, if that's a possibility. So get the grass, get the um, grass really uh, tight and it, 
makes planting a lot easier. Um, so yeah, so get a couple of people or a team of people to mark everything out with canes, bamboo canes, it's a good, good bet. And then what you need is lots of people and lots of space and um, hopefully a nice dry day. Um, I have planted community orchards with people in the driving rain and um, because, you know, when it comes to it, you organize a day and um, the job has to get done. Uh, and they've still done well. It's just a less fun, um, less fun day out. But um, yeah, with lots of people, this was a, a one that I uh, helped with in Cornwall a couple of years ago. And we had the scouts there and um, we planted a couple of hundred trees in a morning. Um, it's, uh, it's really, um, yeah, people power and spades is a good way to go. And I'd avoid the, I'd avoid the diggers um, if you can. So square holes we like um, and round holes we're not such a fan of. Square holes, um, the theory is that the roots go out and they don't end up kind of going round, uh, round and round um, a, a circular hole. Um, it's kind of common practice now for tree planting. About 40 by 40 generally, basically it wants to be a, 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 a it's called, um, you know, pit planting, it wants to be big enough so the roots fit in there comfortably. You don't want to be stuffing the roots into, into a tiny little hole. Um, so uh, but for a kind of maiden tree or a two-year-old tree, you're looking at about 40 square centimeters and don't plant them too deep. You can see in that picture on the left, um, you can see where the tree came out of the nursery. You can see the difference between the colors on the bark there. It just wants to be, the finished soil level just wants to be a couple, you know, five centimeters above the topmost root. Um, I have seen trees planted right up to that that point on the um, on the graph there, and uh, and they don't do terribly well. So fruit trees are kind of surface rooting plants. They don't tend to go they don't go straight down. They go out. Um, so they don't want to be planted too deeply. We don't recommend adding compost to the hole. Um, you just want to be planting. You just want to be planting the tree uh, back into the soil that came out of the hole. You can add uh, if you're inclined. You can add some. Um, Bone meal, which is um, which, uh, is is uh, a good a good addition. Um, mix it up with the soil and mycorrhizal fungi as well. I recommend. Um, uh, so if you can get some of that as a, either as a root dip and you put it in a bucket, mix it up and dip the roots in um, before you plant them, or you can get it as a powder, kind of granule, and you can mix it in again with the soil before you plant it back or you put the soil back in the hole. Um, avoid the compost. Um, but you do want to mulch the tree when you're done. So this, these photos haven't been, the trees haven't been mulched, but um, mulching the tree after you've planted is a much better way um, of improving the soil rather than adding compost to the hole. The problem with compost to the hole, and I've done it myself, kind of trialed it, uh, it holds too much moisture. Um, and um, it, it can, one theory is that it kind of creates a luxury planting pit. The tree, the tree roots don't venture out beyond that hole because you've got this lovely compost and um, in my experience it holds too much moisture and the, the trees can rot and I've lost one year I planted a whole number of trees like this um, in my own orchard and about half of them died from phytophthora so from root rot um, it was too wet so um, we don't recommend that but mulching the trees is really really important after planting um, so staking, again, if you've got a, a tall windy site, um, it's worth staking the trees. Um, half standards generally recommend a kind of 90 centimeter stake uh, and one of these buckle ties, as you see on the left there in the photo, um, or uh, uh, you can get, we sell um, bigger of eight ties, rubber tree ties. Just, it stops the tree uh, rocking around too much at the base. You know, you want the tree to be moving in the top, but you want the base of the tree um, to, be, to be really solid and stable in the ground and not rocking. So um, for a couple of quid per tree, it's worth getting um, some tree stakes and putting the tree ties on correctly and putting them high up, like in this photo. You don't want them halfway down the stake because then you've secured the tree halfway down the stake and the top of the tree is rubbing around on, on the top of the stake and getting damaged. So, um, uh, but yeah, stakes are really um, important. Uh, on the right there is uh, the kind of stake you're gonna need if you're gonna use a more hefty um, kind of livestock guard um, this galvanized world mesh guard there. So you're going to need a, a 1.8 meter or six foot fencing stake. Um, and you're going to have to strap that tree to the stake for the same reason you don't want it rattling around and, um, and rubbing.
So once you've got the tree in the ground, um, you've still got to consider uh, the different things that are wanting to make sure that tree doesn't survive. Quite often they are small creatures. Um, voles are a bit of a nightmare, but they, um, they can be more of a problem if you're using mulch mats. So mulch mats, um, generally woven fabric, uh, woven plastic fabric, or you can get biodegradable jute and wool um, mulch mats, but um, I would basically avoid using them. They, they act as a, a lovely little tent for the voles. Um, and when the voles are bored under the, in their tent, they start eating the tree roots. So um, you're better off mulching the trees and avoiding mulch mats, in my opinion. But voles can also um, damage the bottom of the stems um, in the winter, particularly when the grass is long around the bottom of the trees. Um, they nibble the sap, or they sorry, they nibble the the um, the, the bark um, to get to the sweet sap, and um, they can actually do yeah quite a lot of damage to the tree. So these spiral guards here, as you see in the left photo. Um, or these um, uh, kind of plastic mesh guards in the right photo, they will stop. Um, uh, actually, the one on the right probably won't stop voles. The one on the left will stop the voles. Looking at the one on the right, there's too much space around it, isn't there? So um, they're all, both of these will stop rabbits. They're about 70 centimeters high. They should stop rabbit damage, unless you've got particularly pernicious rabbits, like I have at my nursery. And um, they, uh, I planted an orchard this year, and the rabbits climbed above the 70 centimeter rabbit guard and um, and have killed quite a few trees outside our outside our fenced area I hasten to add so um, in the most part uh, these, these these rabbit spiral guards will do a good job and the ones on the right there which are sold generally as tree shelters for kind of sh um, shrubby um, forest trees um, then also if you if you've got hairs um, you want slightly higher guards. Um, and if in a kind of community orchard, then dogs, I know that can be a problem, but obviously anything like this is going to stop small dogs. Um, if you've got bigger dogs <laughs> or you've got um, livestock, if you're thinking you might have cows in there or sheep that get in, um, then you're going to need a more substantial guard. There's a few examples here. Um, some chicken wire that you can use in the middle photo. That's going to be pretty good against um, uh, against dogs, rabbits, um, hares, uh, and deer. Well, the smaller deer, not red deer, but that's a roe deer, munchak. Um, on the right, you've got a galvanized weld mesh guard, which is much more expensive. They're about probably they're about twenty quid at least um, uh, each. Um, but that's going to stop um, sheep, um, and you can get taller ones to stop cattle. Um, so that's the that's the most heavy duty guard um, and it's kind of what we recommend over the uh, kind of uh, what people used to use which was kind of four stakes or three stakes uh, we find these galvanized weld mesh guards are much more effective and you can use the gal you know you can reuse them after a few years once the tree's big enough that you can wrap chicken wire around the stem then these guards can get reused there's a uh, an example of a um, uh, a mulch mat there uh, which again I would avoid <laughs> um, the, in the photo in the middle has got the mulch around it at the bottom um, wood chip mulch um, as we recommend and on the photo on the left if you've got if you're planting bigger trees or you need you know perhaps a, uh, it's kind of you want to protect them from uh, people with uh, malintent um, then um, you know you might want a more heavy duty two stakes and some um, stocking uh, live stocking live livestock netting um, around the stakes and a couple of straps. So a bit more heavy duty, but it's going to offer the tree a bit more protection, um, again, against animals, but perhaps against um, vandals. Hopefully there aren't too many of those around. OK, so after the trees have been planted, we're talking about um, mapping, labeling, info boards. It's really important to the <laughs> Excuse me. It's really important that um, someone or a few people um, map the orchard. It's the, the the tree tags that come on the trees when you buy them will last for a year or two, a couple of years. But they they come off, they get um, eaten, they get photo, they photo degrade. It's really important that after they've been planted, um, you make sure that there is a map of what's what and where it is. Um, you know, ultimately it doesn't matter that much, but people really like to know what it is that they've got in the orchard. Um, 
uh, what it is they're eating, what they're what they're juicing from, and 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 what these old varieties are and what they taste like. So, um, you you know, making individual tree labels like this one on the left, that's from Bridport Community Orchard, um, really helpful. I think having a bit more info on them is even better. Maybe when to pick the apples, for example, um, when they're ready, if they're if they're apples that need or if they're fruit that needs to be stored, then having that info on the label is really good um, and means hopefully then there's less wastage. Um, having info boards is obviously really um, you know, a great way to engage people and having as much information on there as possible. Um, and then also, you know, as the photos in the beginning, managing those hedges, managing those wind breaks. Um, that's another job that, you know, it's a nice job for the winter, getting some, um, get some people together to do some hedge laying, some coppicing. Um, uh, it's another event that needs doing that is, um, you know, keeps people interested. Mulching, as I said, is I can't express how important mulching is for young trees, particularly, you know, basically the idea of mulching is that you're um, stopping the weeds from growing. And by weeds, we're talking about grass, we're talking about anything that's growing under the bottom of the tree in the first few years, certainly the first, say, three years, um, uh, because whatever's growing there is taking away water from the tree. It's, and the grass is very, is a kind of a water bully. It will take up the, the water um, and deny the tree. You have a year like we've had to, uh, this year, the summer like this summer, and um, trees that have been mulched like this will, will, will survive and they will, they will thrive. And, um, uh, and trees that haven't will just, will, will, they won't do. So um, wood chip is the best thing you can get. Um, you know, speak to your local tree surgeons, um, see if you can find a designated area of your community orchard which, uh, where someone can be dumping wood chip regularly. You have a nice big pile of it, let it rot down for a season ideally, and then um, put it around the trees as thick as you can. Obviously not burying the stem, but in a nice um, thick mulch like in, the, in that middle photo. You're stopping the weed from growing, you're, you're, um, you're retaining moisture in the soil and you're feeding the soil as well. That wood chip's all slowly um, rotting down, feeding the soil. Uh, is uh, you know it's becoming a very um, it's becoming more and more uh, widely used um, and uh, and its its benefits are, are being more widely understood. Um, so yeah, wood chip. Um, if you can't get wood chip, then straw is good as well. Straw and hay, um, old hay, grass clippings. If you're managing the orchard, um, cutting the grass, cutting areas, then then putting fresh grass clippings down and compost is also good. It needs to be well, well rotted manure compost um, after you've planted the tree. And you want, as I say, keep, keep it topped up if you can, but it's most important in the first three years. And the tree will do kind of 50% better, 80% better if it has got a nice thick mulch around it. Um, uh, yeah, we can't, um, can't recommend it highly enough. So that's kind of the, um, the, uh, the whistle stop tour of how to plant your how to plan your community orchard and hopefully everyone's still with us and um we've got we can have some questions thank you so much tom that was incredibly useful and i have made lots of notes and ways that we can improve what we suggest to everybody so thank you um i'm just going to now swap this over to speak of you right so we've had some um questions come in um as you've been chatting so i will uh read those out so um michael asked um can an ornamental cherry pollinate a fruit cherry tree uh yes if it's in flower at the same time i'm pretty sure it will but um <laughs> yeah I, i'm pretty sure it will if it's in flower at the same time it should be fine that, that answers that um, easily. Um, we also, we had a question come in on email. Um, so, um, well, let me find it. Um, so Amanda asks, how important, and you did kind of like cover this a little bit, but how important is the type and structure of our soil when planning our orchard? Yeah, um, uh, it is important, but um, you you can obviously uh, kind of adjust, adjust things. So, in terms of pH, ideally you don't want it more acidic than kind of 5.5. It's like the bottom kind of um, uh, pH that you want anywhere between 5.5 and 6.7 is absolutely fine. Fruit trees generally like it slightly acidic. Um, 
if it, if you are lower than 5.5, then you want to think about adding lime, um, uh, garden lime, which you can just get from the garden centre. Um, so when you plant the tree and um, perhaps adding it in the, um, you know, con continually. Um, the problem if you've got very acidic or very alkaline soil is that the tree then can't take up the nutrients or potentially can't take up certain nutrients. So it's going to have um, deficiencies. But um, most, you know, most soils are falling in a, a kind of suitable range. But it's worth doing a soil, a pH test um, and making those adjustments with garden lime if necessary. Um, if you've got a very alkaline soil, if you're kind of on, on chalk and you've got very alkaline soil, then um, wood chip has been shown to be a really good way of um, bringing, you know, kind of alleviating that. Um, and in terms of soil structure, yeah. Um, Again, like mulching is a really good way to improve soil structure rather than, um, I mean, if you've got kind of, if it's an, perhaps a new development and you've, and it's been kind of, um, as I said earlier, the top soil has been stripped and all you actually, what you're dealing with is kind of subsoil, you know, um, kind of uh, potting clay essentially, then maybe in that instance, it might be worth adding some compost, but generally, you know, to the planting hole where you're planting the tree, but generally, it's not worth doing that. Um, generally, the best way to improve the soil structure is by um, mulching them, mulching around the trees regularly. Great. And um, I just I wondered, like, if um, would your soil pH kind of suggest um, different varieties? Like, other varieties? There are some. Yeah. So there are some. There are some. For example, apple varieties, which do um, better um, than others on a kind of more alkaline soil. Um, I can't think what they are now. Uh, <laughs> I have looked into it before for for you know for customers who are growing on kind of on chalk, um, but um, yeah, generally um, uh, anything under six point seven is is going to be is going to be fine. Okay, okay, so maybe just if it's kind of on the you, extreme end, have a Google. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a case of you know if you're on very um, if you're on very if you're on very alkaline soil, then it would be worth um. Doing a bit of research, there are there are some varieties which do better than high alkaline. Ah, um, so we've actually oh, had a John's few. put his hand up. I don't know whether he's got a better answer. Oh, <laughs> um, John, uh, can you uh, type into the chat um, your comment? That would be great. Um, just uh, let's just check. Um, so we've had a couple of questions about um, mulching. So yep. uh, Michael's asked, can they use sawdust? And Marion's asked, could ash from an open fire, mostly wood, but some coal be used? Okay, so um, sawdust is not so good on its own. It's basically pure carbon and it doesn't really, it takes a very, very long time um, to break down. Um, and in, in order for it to break down, you, it's just, you're basically um, using nitrogen in the soil, kind of robbing nitrogen um, from the soil for, in order for it to break down. It will break down eventually. But um, if you've got sawdust, I would, you would be better off turning it into compost with some green waste, you know, um, grass clippings, for example, stuff that comes out of the, the kitchen um, and making, a, a, you know, letting it rot down, decompose, making a nice compost and using it in, in that way rather than applying it as um, sawdust, I'm afraid, yeah. Okay, fab. Um, so uh, well, there was a second part to that question, wasn't there? Was um, um, so yes, yeah, so someone asked about sawdust and then Marion asked about um, using like um, ash from, a, from an- Oh yeah, wood ash, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, but okay. also um, um, wood ash is great. wood, but some coal, she says. Wood ash is great, coal's not so great. Um, uh, yeah, um, I probably, yeah. I, Wood ash is, is a good thing to add. It, it's um, the benefits are are only kind of seen if you if you put it out in the spring when the tree is kind of coming into growth because it, it's a so, it, the um, potassium is soluble and will be kind of leached. If you put it out in the say beginning of the winter, then it will um, get literally washed through the ground. If you put it out in the spring when the tree starts to come into growth, then the tree can use it basically. Um, not you don't want to be putting loads down there but yeah you, you another useful way uh, of using it perhaps is, is in compost a bit like with with the sawdust you know adding it to your compost pile um uh, especially if it's got a bit of coal coal dust in there might be a, a better way I, I i wouldn't i know that coal is coal dust is perhaps not um or coal ash um is 
generally not considered a good thing to be putting around them. But um, maybe if you could mix it in with your compost fluid decomposed, that, that could be a good, good mm -hmm. way of getting rid of it. OK, bit of a safer bet to do to yeah. composting then. Um, uh, so another question. Um, so will dwarf M27 apple trees ever get to a size where they do not need to be staked? So it's not um, it's not to do It's basically the short answer is no. Um, it's because uh, uh, M27 apple tree is very small, or it stays very small because the roots themselves are very fragile. Um, it's the same with M9s. Um, the, the roots themselves break really easily and they literally can't hold the tree up if it has a lot of fruit on it. Um, so, it, n no. <laughs> um, okay, and um, another question that kind of uh, follows on from that. Um, should branches be propped up or should you just let them hang down laden with fruit? Um, well, I so, so it depends a bit on it depends a bit on what your um what you're thinking uh, of you doing with the fruit. If it's um dessert fruit or cooking fruit and you want to store it through the winter, you want to use it, you want people to um enjoy it that way. I would be thinning the trees in June. So go out there and you thin uh kind of put if you had a cluster of five fruits, then you'd thin three of them back to two or even thin them back to one. To the point where your branches aren't actually kind of hanging down on the ground or hanging down that heavily or certainly they're not at the point where they're in danger of, of breaking um uh you'll get uh, you'll get better quality fruit you'll get the same yield it's just uh, that all the fruit will be bigger so um if it's for cider or something like that then it doesn't matter so much and yeah uh propping them is not necessarily a bad idea if it's going to stop them from snapping the ideal is to thin them in June, July, so that you, they're not at risk of breaking like that. There, I've got a video actually on uh, YouTube, uh, Adam's Apples Nursery video about fruit thinning, just a short one, might be uh, might be interesting to some of you. Oh, okay, brilliant. So yeah, um, yeah, pop over to the Adam's Apple website. For more uh, it's on the, on the YouTube. If you type oh, in Adam's yeah. Apple's YouTube, fruit thinning, I think it will come up. It's uh, been there a while. <laughs> Okay, and yeah, so um, Alyssa has actually asked, will we be doing a talk about apple cherry tree pruning later on? And we are um, we are um, maybe organising a kind of pruning workshop, um, but perhaps we could maybe talk about doing a, an online talk as well, um, if that would be yeah. of use to everybody. Yeah. Um, um, go. Oh, sorry, no, I mean, obviously it's more, it's always going to be better um, in person, but maybe we can, we can have a chat about doing something online, yeah. Okay, um, thank you. Um, lovely question here from Ruth. Do you have any advice for managing the area under the trees? So is leave it, just leaving it to grass sensible or is encouraging wildflowers recommended? Yeah, sorry, I've kind of meant to cover that and um, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, the best thing for biodiversity in, a, in an orchard is to have um, is to have as much variety as possible. So actually keeping areas um, long, keeping areas with long grass, perhaps keeping areas that you actually don't cut um, over the winter. It um, doesn't have to be all of it, but keeping particular areas long over the winter and then cutting them in the spring and then maybe alternating it the following year, um, leaving as much di diverse of, diversity of habitat as possible is obviously, you know, that's the key to, to good um, biodiversity, isn't it? Having lots of variation. Um, in terms of kind of managing it through the summer, yeah, I mean, you can either um, kind of low input management is just to mow paths through the orchard, either with a mower or, a, or um, you know, agree with the council just for them just to mow um, paths so you can walk through with the side and then maybe cut the grass when it's, um, when, thing, when things are flowered, when grass is um, set seed later in the summer, kind of September. Um, uh, that's one way of, of managing it. It means that you're not, you know, you're not having to cut um, cut the grass all the time and again you're having quite a diverse um, mix of, of, of grasses and flowers coming through the summer. Um, sides are a really nice way of managing the grass kind of you know quiet and um, uh, yeah it, it, it's um, yeah scything is, uh, is much easier than people think it, it keeps you fit it's really quite a few community orchards have um, some kind of budding side side scythers um, out there managing it. Um, 
uh, otherwise it's yeah in terms of establishing wildflowers under the trees yeah after a few years of mulching and the trees really um, established and doing well at that point maybe you could start looking at sowing wildflowers um, and daffodils and you know uh, different things under underneath the trees themselves but for the first say three years you really want to just keep it mulched um, I hope that answers yeah definitely um and actually if um if anybody would like more um advice on wildflower meadows um our wilder communities team might be able to help um so it's worth uh getting in touch with them so um you can email me and, and i can um and i can put you in touch um and they can provide some advice and, and links to other groups so uh yeah do let us know if you because obviously that's um really up to the wildlife value so it's something we're really keen on um We've got yeah, we're hoping. Questions. Sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Didn't mean to cut you in there. We were hoping to produce a little document about managing the grass, managing the orchard. Um, I don't know whether we'll get it this summer, but hopefully for next. Sorry, this <laughs> this winter, but hopefully for next year. So um, that could be, um, yeah, that we're going to start sending out with the trees. So how to manage the kind of manage the grass for uh, how to manage the orchard for wildlife. Um, that might be of interest as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so okay so it's it's just gone seven so i'm really sorry for those who've asked a question um um and we we're not we've not got time but what i'll do is i'll i'll write down all your questions that we haven't answered and um we'll see if we can we'll get we might be able to get those answered and um um, um emailed out to you um but thank you so much tom like that that no was, was so I, I useful, it was so useful. Yeah. And um, and yeah, I'm really interesting and lots to think about. And I did get to ask my triploid um, question. Oh, yeah. So a very complicated uh, topic. <laughs> well, I, it seems to me. Um, so perhaps um, perhaps we can uh, put together a little bit um, of advice to send out to anybody. But um, if anybody would like to apply for orchard trees, uh, do get in touch with me. Um, we actually buy our, our trees from Adam's apples. Um, but yeah, you can apply uh, through us and we can help you um, create your community orchard. So um, thank you so much for everybody who's, who've come along. Um, what I'll do is I'll uh, shut the meeting up now and um, yeah, any further questions do get in touch. And okay. thank you so much. Thanks everyone for coming, yeah. Nice to see you.